Hello everyone and welcome to this year's Summer Food Service Program Annual Training. This webinar will focus on a general overview of the summer program and is most appropriate for sponsor administrative staff. We will begin with an overview of what the Summer Food Service Program is. The Summer Food Service Program was established to ensure that children continue to receive nutritious meals during the months when school is not in session. These meals are provided to children in low-income areas and make meals available at no cost to participants. These meals can be provided to children, which, as the USDA defines it, is any person's 18 years of age and under. During this PowerPoint, we will be covering the following topics. Training and monitoring requirements, record retention, meal site eligibility, meal pattern, and meal service requirements. All these topics are important for administrative staff to understand as they are key pieces to ensuring that your organization is maintaining program integrity and oversight. The first topic we will discuss today is training. In order to be approved to participate in the SFSP, all sponsors must attend an annual training hosted by the state agency. This applies to both new and returning sponsors. At least one sponsor representative must attend RIDE's training. However, RIDE encourages that more than one member of the organization attends. RIDE gives a high-level overview of the program that sometimes might not be specific to an organization's actual operations. The sponsor should use RIDE's training as a starting point and include specific details that pertain to the sponsor's organization. This training should be then used to train remaining administrative and operational staff. The topics that staff get trained on should pertain to their specific responsibilities within the SFSP. Therefore, not all staff need to be trained on every aspect of the SFSP. However, all staff are required to receive civil rights training annually, regardless of their responsibilities within the program. In order to support training efforts, you will need to maintain records of all the attendees, the agenda, and the sign-in sheets for the training, showing that all staff have received training. The agenda should have the topics listed out separately, so we can clearly see what items were covered, such as civil rights, meal counting, food safety, etc. If possible, have the staff list their associated meal site, since RIDE will look to see that a staff member from each site attended the training during a program review. In addition to training all administrative and operational staff, sponsors are also responsible for monitoring their meal service sites on a regular basis to ensure compliance with program regulations. As an overview, sponsors are required to conduct the following monitoring visits per regulation. Pre-operational visit, first two weeks site visit, and a full site review in the first four weeks. We will talk further about each of these visits in the next slides. Monitoring is critical to the SFSP as it ensures that sites operate according to federal requirements and that program integrity is being upheld. It also ensures that accurate records are maintained and available and that site staff are completing them correctly. Lastly, monitoring ensures that children in the community are receiving nutritious meals and that meals are going only to children who should be receiving them. As discussed in the previous slides, you will need to make sure that all of your monitors have been trained on all necessary topics so that your monitors are equipped to identify and correct any issues noted during a monitoring visit. While at the site, the monitor must review the meal counting and claiming procedures that the site has established. This includes how staff are taking meal counts, whether they are marking off second meals correctly, and that they are not marking adult meals as any children meals, whether it is first or second. 
the monitor should be making sure that the meals that are served are meeting meal pattern compliance and that all meals marked off to be included in the claim for reimbursement are in fact reimbursable. Monitors should also be making sure that sites are operating in accordance with general program regulations, such that food safety measures are being followed. The and justice for all poster is being displayed in a visible place, etc. With new monitoring regulations taking place due to the final integrity rule that was released in 2022, the next few slides that follow may be new to sponsors. Please be sure that you as a sponsor fully understand these requirements and that they are clearly communicated to your monitor during training. This slide discusses two types of monitoring observations that may occur depending on each individual site a site visit or a site review. Each have different definitions as outlined in regulation. A site visit indicates that the monitor must ensure the site is meeting program regulations during a meal service. However, the monitor is not required to observe the meal service in its entirety during a site visit. During a site review, a monitor must determine if the site is meeting all the various program requirements. To accomplish this, a monitor will have to observe a complete meal service from beginning to end. A complete meal service includes observing the delivery or preparation of meals, the meal service, and cleanup after the service. All visits and or reviews must be conducted as required and documented. The first type of visit that we will be talking about is the pre-operational visit. The pre-operational visit must be conducted by any sponsors that have new non-school sites, sites that will be operating a non-congregate meal service for the first time, or sites that have had operational problems during the previous summer. The pre-operational visit is used to determine that the site has the necessary facilities and capability to conduct the proposed meal service for the projected number of participants. Therefore, this type of visit must be done prior to operations beginning and the pre-operational form must be completed and uploaded to the site application in CNP Connect for rides approval. Sites required to have a pre-operational visit will not be approved for participation without this form. Sponsors can see the download form section in CNP Connect to access the pre-operational visit form. For more information of RIDE's policy regarding the definition and identification of operational problems, sponsors can see the download form section of CNP Connect. A site visit within the first two weeks must be completed for sites that meet any of the following criteria. New, non-school sites, sites operating a non-congregate meal service for the first time, and any sites with operational problems in the previous year. The first two weeks site visits determine whether the food service operation is running smoothly and requires prompt correction for any issues that are identified. Lastly, all sites must have a full site review completed. This can be completed at any point within the first four weeks of program operation. For any sites that operate for less than four weeks, the site review must be conducted before operations end. This visit can be conducted at the same time as the first two week site visit for any sites that are required to complete both monitoring requirements. Both monitoring forms must be completed in full if utilizing this option. For the site review, the monitor must observe a complete meal service from the beginning to the end, including the delivery or preparation of meals, the actual meal service, meal counting, and the cleanup. The monitor should communicate any issues, technical assistance, or training within the, with the site supervisor. 
Make sure any communication you have is documented on the monitor's review form. The monitor should then ensure that issues are communicated with the sponsor and that appropriate follow-up is conducted and documented. All monitoring visits must be conducted using ride provided monitoring forms, all of which can be found in the download form section of CNP Connect. Monitoring reports can only be completed by a sponsor staff member. Sponsors must have a process in place for monitoring reports to be reviewed by the individual within the sponsor's organization who is responsible for the overall SFSP as well as, as with site level staff to ensure that any required follow up is conducted. During the site visit or review, everything should be documented, including technical assistance given, any issues found, the corrective action that is required, and if a follow-up visit is necessary. Once a monitoring visit is complete, the report must be signed and dated by both the monitor and site supervisor. If corrective action is deemed necessary during the monitoring visit or review, the subsequent corrective action that takes place, along with the implementation date, names, or titles of applicable staff members, and any other relevant information should also be documented. If an, if an informal site visit occurs where any technical assistance or training was provided, make sure that it is documented as well to help RIDE get a better sense of any issues and subsequent corrective actions that have taken place. During a program review, RIDE will use your program records to recreate your claim for reimbursement by meal period for the review month. Records that need to be maintained for each type of meal preparation method will differ slightly as shown on the screen. RIDE will use the documents on this slide to rebuild the claim for reimbursement by validating the following. The number of meals claimed do not exceed the number of meals prepared and or available. The number of meals claimed do not exceed the number of meals delivered and or available. Foods that appear on item as receipts also appear on the menu and vice versa. Menus are maintained with marked substitutions that match to what is listed as being served on either production records or delivery slips. All food items and meals are purchased, prepared, and served in at least the minimum required amounts for reimbursable meal. This allows RIDE to ensure that all meals are in fact reimbursable and can be claimed for reimbursement by the sponsor. Saved records are the only way that we can validate a sponsor's claim. If documentation is not available, reviewers will be required to disallow meals for the days that no records exist. Records supporting program expenses help us determine if the sponsor is operating a nonprofit food service account by comparing the reimbursement amount received, the amount spent on all program operations, including administrative costs, and what items or services were purchased. To determine if federal funds are being spent appropriately, RIDE will ensure that meals were purchased at the contractually agreed upon price per each meal type. The sponsor is adjusting meals daily to ensure the intent of the program of feeding one meal per child per meal period is met. SFSP reimbursements are spent only on allowable costs as approved in the SFSP budget. As a reminder, SFAs do not complete the budget portion of the SFSP application, but all costs must still be considered allowable program expenses. Meals within the SFSP are reimbursed at a specific rate per meal period per child, and the reimbursement rate will also depend on your site type. SFSP reimbursement rates are updated annually and are generally released by RIDE around March of each year. 
the rates on the slide shown are for this fiscal year summer season. SFSP rates are divided into two categories, self-preparation and rural sites or other. All sites that vend meals from a food service management company or a school district would fall into the other category. When completing your SFSP application in our online ma application management system, you must ac accurately reflect which type of site you are operating. One category of eligibility that will need to be determined for sponsors is if they are located in an area that is considered to be urban or rural. As you saw on the previous slide, any site that is determined to be in a rural setting, as defined by the USDA, will receive a higher reimbursement amount per meal. Rural sites are also eligible to operate a non-congregate meal service. This allows the site to prepare and distribute meals that are intended to be eaten off-site. Sponsors can elect to serve multiple meals and or multiple days worth of food at once. Sponsors will need to indicate that they wish to operate this meal service within the site application and should expect follow-up information to be requested from their application specialist before approval is given. Sponsors can check to see if their site is considered to be rural or urban through the USDA Rural Reg Designation Tool or the No Kid Hungry Summer Meals Eligibility Map. If you have questions regarding non-congregate meal service for your site, please reach out to a member of the FS SFSP team. Urban sites will receive a slightly lower reimbursement rate and cannot operate a non-congregate meal service. Meals must be eaten on site with the exception of whole fruit or vegetables and appropriate grain items. There are two types of site eligibility within the SFSP, and they are area eligibility and eligibility based on meal benefit applications. The type of eligibility used will depend on the meal site type, which we will discuss in the following slides. Area eligibility refers to areas in which at least 50% of the children residing in the area are eligible for free or reduced price meals at their school. A meal benefit application is a form that collects information on the income and size of a participant's household. Sites using this method must have at least 50% of their participants qualify for free or reduced price meals. Sites may either distribute collect and determine these applications themselves or use a meal benefit application determina determinations from a school, depending on the type of meal site. Any non-school food authority sponsors that wish to receive eligibility information based on the meal benefit applications collected from a school will need to sign into an MOU with the respective school district. The MOU can be found in the download form section of CNP Connect. There are several ways you can determine area eligibility. If one method doesn't qualify your site, we recommend trying each of the different methods. First, you can use school data, which displays the percentage of students who qualify for free and reduced price meals in each school. This report is released by RIDE each winter to sponsors, and any school that meets 50% qualifies for area eligibility. Please note that this is also sometimes referred to as the eligibility report. A site can either be located in a qualifying school or in the attendance area of a qualifying school. Next, you could use census data, which can be verified through several different mapping resources, all of which are linked at the end of this PowerPoint. Each of these mapping tools have instructions on how to interpret the results. In general though, each map typically has each type of result color coded. So non-eligible areas will appear on the map as one color, while area eligible areas will be a different color. Finally, some welfare agencies or housing authorities may use income criteria that matches or is lower than the income guidelines used in the SFSP and therefore would qualify. 
For any of the above eligibility methods, the sponsor should make an initial determination and save the related documentation, but all determinations must be validated by RIDE before they can be approved. Within the SFSP, there are multiple types of summer meal sites, open, closed or enrolled, and camp. We'll start by talking about open meal sites. These sites must qualify based on one of the area eligibility methods that were reviewed in the previous slide. At an open site, meals are given to qualifying children on a first come, first serve basis. Participants do not need to prove residence within the community and attendance does not need to be recorded at this type of meal site, but all participants must be 18 or under in order to be considered eligible. It is your job as a sponsor to allow access to the largest extent possible to all participants, and therefore you must eliminate any barriers to participation, which may include physical barriers, allergies, disabilities, and language barriers. In order to ensure meaningful access, you will need to advertise the program within your community in methods that will most effectively reach all residents. Next, we'll review closed enrolled sites. Closed enrolled sites can sometimes be referred to as either just closed or enrolled. Closed sites may be able to qualify as a site through area eligibility or by collecting meal benefit applications, either from the participants themselves or through school data. These sites are only eligible to feed participants who are enrolled in their organization or program rather than the community at large. Because of this, attendance and enrollment information for each participant is required. Closed or enrolled programs must provide recreational, cultural, religious, or other types of organized activity for a specific group of children. The last type of meal site is a campsite. Camps must offer regularly scheduled food service to enrolled participants as part of their organized program. This is similar to the requirement for closed or enrolled sites, but there are a few differences that should be considered when determining whether your site should be designated as a closed or enrolled site or a camp. Camps are able to claim one additional meal per day than open or enrolled sites, but any camp that operates under the SFSP, whether they are residential or non-residential, must collect meal benefit applications from all enrolled participants. Or alternatively, camps may be able to gather the meal benefit application data from school districts. Camps cannot use area eligibility for a site since they may only claim meals for reimbursement for those participants who qualify for free or reduced price meals. Meals served to participants not qualifying for free or reduced price meals must be subsidized by the sponsor from non-federal funds. School sites that provide meals only to enrolled academic summer school students are not eligible to participate in the summer food service program. Summer enrichment programs held within a school may operate in the SFSP as closed or enrolled site, but if the summer program offered is a requirement of graduation, this would be considered a summer school and meals would be claimed for reimbursement under the NSLP rather than SFSP. If a school site offers a summer school program but is also eligible and willing to provide meals to the broader community as an open site, then summer school students could be served and claimed under the SFSP as part of the broader open site. The eligibility duration of a site will differ based on the type of meal site. Open and closed or enrolled sites that have been determined based on area eligibility methods are good for five years. Closed enrolled meal sites based on meal benefit applications as well as camps must be redetermined annually. Now that we have discussed the types of meal sites and methods of eligibility determinations, we will review how to add a new site to your agreement with RIDE. 
your organization or a member of the RIDE SFSP team may identify a potentially eligible meal site. Prior to adding the site to your agreement, your organization will need to get confirmation from RIDE that the site is area eligible. If the site is not area eligible, then the sponsor is responsible for collecting and maintaining documentation to show that 50% of the enrolled participants qualify for free or reduced priced meal benefits. Once it has been determined that a site is eligible for participation, the sponsor should reach out to RIDE to advise of the new site addition. The site name, address, as well as the anticipated start date must be emailed only to one of the designated RIDE SFSP specialists. RIDE will then create the site in our CNP Connect system and add the site to the sponsor's agreement. This step can sometimes take a few days. RIDE will then notify the sponsor that the site has been added to their agreement and that the sponsor can now go into CNP Connect and proceed with updating site-specific information for the new site. Once the sponsor submits the agreement packet in CNP Connect with the new site information, RIDE will review the site information and either reach out with any questions or approve the agreement packet. As a reminder, the steps that we have just discussed have been uploaded in the downloaded form section of SFSP. Meal pattern requirements are essential to the summer food service program as they assure that participants receive the well-balanced, nutritious meals that they are entitled to. These requirements are developed to help children meet their nutrient and energy needs, which is why minimum portion sizes are established. Because of this, these requirements need to be met at all times during the program. You can also expect RIDE to closely review the compliance of these requirements during a program audit. For summer, you can elect to serve one of the following meal types. Breakfast, AM slash PM snack, lunch, and supper. Any combination of two meals aside from lunch and supper can be served together at either open or closed sites. Camps are able to serve up to three meals a day in any combination. This slide shows examples of the different meal service combinations that non-camp sites can elect to implement. You are limited to a total of two meal services per day with the exception of combining the lunch and supper meal services, which was mentioned on the previous slide. As you know, all meals served under the SFSP must contain all the required components in at least the minimum quantities in order to be considered reimbursable. When all components are provided with every meal, RIDE refers to this type of meal service as straight serve, and it is the method used by most SFSP sponsors. However, if you are an SFA, you will have an option to implement a different style that we will discuss later in this training. The SFSP meal patterns are as follows. For breakfast, this must include milk, fruit, or vegetable, or a combination of both, as well as a grain. At lunch and supper, these meals are only considered to be complete and reimbursable if they contain milk, a grain, a meat or a meat alternate component, and the minimum required two servings of fruit and or vegetables. For snack, two of the four meal components must be served in any combination that the sponsor wishes. Please remember in the summer program that fruits and vegetables are considered to be the same component. Therefore, you can't serve apples and celery as a reimbursable snack. In addition, you cannot serve two different liquid components as the entire snack. So serving fruit or vegetable juice and milk is not a reimbursable snack. The meal patterns and serving sizes are configured differently for SFSP than for other programs and should be reviewed carefully. A link to the complete SFSP meal pattern, which includes more information on the serving size of each component, is included at the end of this PowerPoint. 
This slide contains general reminders around the SFSP meal pattern. When determining the amount needed for a serving of fruits or vegetables, you must measure this in volume, i.e. cups. The fruit or vegetable component must be comprised of two different fruit and or vegetable food items for a total amount of three-fourths cup. Items like fresh oranges in combination with orange juice are not permitted. Additionally, juice cannot make up more than 50% of this component. Milk must be served in the minimal required amounts as part of a reimbursable meal. Two liquid food items cannot be combined as a reimbursable snack. For example, fruit or vegetable juice cannot be served during snack if milk is the other component and vice versa. Any processed meat or meat alternates in addition to any combination food items will need to have a corresponding child nutrition label, product formulation statement, or recipe on file to verify meal pattern compliance. As mentioned earlier, Offer versus Serve, or OVS, is an alternate style of meal service that is only available for use by SFAs. By choosing OVS as your style of meal service, you are able to follow either the SFSP or SBP slash NSLP meal pattern. If an SFA chooses to use OVS for their meal service, they will need to indicate this is their online agreement along with which program meal pattern they will implement. When using an OVS style of meal service, site staff must ensure that the children choose the minimum required amount of components before being included in the point of service meal counts. For each meal period, this means at breakfast, there must be a minimum of one food item for each of the three required components offered along with additional food item for any component offered. A child must take at least three different food items to be considered a reimbursable breakfast. For lunch and supper, require that five food items of the four different food components be offered. Please keep in mind that while fruit and vegetables are the same component, you are required to offer at least two different food items for this component. A child must take a minimum of three different food items for a reimbursable meal. As a reminder, you may not use offer versus serve during snack. Sponsors must establish meal times for each site. This is done in CNP Connect. For all non-camp sites, a minimum of one hour must elapse between the end of one meal service and the beginning of another. Additionally, breakfast must be served towards the beginning of the day and cannot be served after lunch. Once a time frame is selected, all meals included in the claim for reimbursement for that meal period need to be served within this time frame. We recommend that you give yourself a buffer when filling out this portion of the online agreement. Consider adding 15 minutes before the start and after the end of your planned meal service, just in case food is delivered either earlier or later than normal. Ride may disallow meals if we see them served outside of your time frame that is approved in CNP Connect. If you change your meal service times, you must update this in CNP Connect. These changes must be made and approved before you make any changes to your actual service. In addition to serving meals with the serving times, you also have to make sure that all children receive one meal before any second or adult meals are served. Lastly, you will need to ensure that you are adhering to all local health and safety regulations. For example, you will need to make sure your milk is held on ice and that all food is properly stored during service rather than left sitting out in the sun. All sites designated as urban and for rural sites that elect not to use the non-congregate meal service must meet on-site meal service regulations. There are a few exceptions, however, one of which is that children can take one whole fruit vegetable, or one grain item off-site for later consumption. 
For grain items, we recommend it be a pre-packaged item, like a single serve pack of crackers. Sponsors should only allow an item to be taken off site if they have adequate staffing to properly administer and monitor the site and to ensure that issues particularly related to food safety and pro program integrity do not arise. RIDE may prohibit individual sponsors on a case-by-case -case basis from using this option if the sponsor's ability to provide adequate oversight is in question. Field trips are allowable as long as they are communicated to RIDE ahead of time in the field trip section of CNP Connect as seen in the image on the slide. If you are sponsoring an open site that will take a field trip, the original site must remain open to the public for meal service as well unless you receive prior approval from RIDE. Regardless of the site type, if a sponsor is modifying a meal service at a site, i.e. closing for a day or changing meal times, etc., the sponsor must notify RIDE and the community impacted by the change. If RIDE conducts a monitoring visit and there are no participants at the site due to a field trip that was not communicated to us, then RIDE will disallow meals for that day. For any sites that plan to serve and claim meals while on a field trip, you must ensure that the proper means to hold the food safety are available. Sponsors need to make sure that any meals held during a field trip are within safe temperatures prior to serving them to participants. Sponsors should be recording the temperatures of holding equipment and or food items themselves. If food is found to be at an unsafe temperature, the sponsor cannot serve and claim the meals for reimbursement. The intention of the SFSP is to ensure that you are preparing meals for only the number of participants that you intend to serve. You will need to have a process in place that allows you to adjust meal counts on a daily or weekly basis, with the goal of serving only one meal per child per meal period. Sponsors should make sure that this process offers the flexibility to find a balance between preparing and ordering an excessive number of meals while also assuring that sites are not continuously running out of meals. Even with the best planning, you are likely to have leftover meals over the course of the summer. Please be reminded that these meals cannot be provided to families to take home. However, leftover meals can be donated to charitable organizations if they are held correctly allowed by your organization and indicated in the site application. Another option sponsors can consider utilizing is the transferring of leftover meals from one site to another site at which there is a shortage of meals. Sponsors should only utilize this option if the extra meals have been properly held throughout service and can be safely transported to and held at the other site. Sponsors should also keep in mind that they must appropriately document the transfer as well. It should be noted somewhere on the delivery slip, meal count sheet, etc., which site meals were transferred from, the number of meals that were transferred, and which site the meals were transferred to. Make sure that the information on the meal count sheet reflects this transfer, such as number of meals available, number of leftover meals, etc. This ensures that the flow of your daily meal count numbers accurately reflects the transfers. The USDA understands that at open sites, it is difficult to know how many people will come on a given day. Because of this, second meals can be claimed up to no more than 2% of the total first meals claimed. This allows your organization to recover some of the cost associated with the meals that were unable to be claimed as first meals. Please note, second meals must be served as a complete meal in order to be claimed for reimbursement. We know that for many of you, waste is a concern, especially when meals are unitized and can't be chosen. To combat waste, sites can set up a share table where participants can place them that they don't want. 
the share table should be located somewhere after the meal service line to allow for point of service meal counts to be taken. Once children have received all the required food items, they can then place unwanted items on the table in which other children can then grab the items if they want. Please be reminded that food must be held safely when utilizing share tables. This means having appropriate storage units for items that need to be held as a safe, at a safe temperature, for example, milk. Lastly, please ensure that when items are put back into service, such as from the share table or leftover items, that they must be documented appropriately. Per SFSP regulation, all meals must be counted as they are served to each child during the point of service, and this includes field trips. Only those meals which contain all of the required components can be counted as reimbursable. If you receive vended meals that are damaged or incomplete, those cannot be counted as reimbursable meals. As mentioned in the beginning of the training, reimbursable meals can only be served to children, which is anyone 18 years and under. We recommend using the checkoff sheet that is shown on the slide. When you train your staff to use this form, be sure they are trained to complete all fields on the form, especially the number of meals received, number of meals available from the previous day, and any leftover meals from that day. During reviews, we often see that these fields are not completed or are filled out inaccurately. As a result, we are not able to follow the day-to-day -day flow of meals that were available and served, which can lead to the disallowance of meals. Any sponsor that produces meals for multiple sites or receives vended meals must have some way of documenting the number of meals that were delivered to each site. This is typically recorded through a delivery slip. Documentation must be maintained not only to show the total number of meals delivered, but also what food items were actually delivered, especially if the food items received vary from the items listed on the planned menu. Delivery slips should be created or adjusted to meet the needs of your organization. They should be available for every day that meals are received from your vendor and should include the following. Name and address of the vendor, the date that the food was delivered and the meal period the food is intended for, the name and address of the site the food was delivered to, the food item actually delivered, which should document all food items actually served as part of a reimbursable meal, including any substitution to the plan menu. If meals are being received for multiple meal periods, be sure that it is clearly listed which items correspond to which meal period. Any substitutions received to accommodate food allergies or lifestyle choices should also be listed. How much of an individual component was delivered this can be listed in the number of portions or total amount delivered per meal component. Please note that depending on how you receive your milk, RIDE considers individual pint containers to be portions of milk, while gallons are considered to be total amounts. RIDE relies on milk purchases to determine if the number of meals claimed are compliant with the meal pattern. Lastly, delivery slips should include the planned serving size for the menu or combination items as applicable. Please be aware that RIDE will rely heavily on this documentation in conjunction with menus marked with substitutions, invoices, receipts, and when applicable, production records to reconstruct your claim for reimbursement for the review month. As previously mentioned, missing documentation may result in the disallowance of meals, as this is the only means that we have to validate your claim for reimbursement. Sponsors can find a resource regarding documenting complete and accurate information on vendor delivery slips in the download form section of the SFSP title in CNP Connect. Although 
delivery slips are Ride's main way to verify that meals served meet meal pattern requirements. There are also a handful of other documents that Ride relies on during a review, including invoices. These should be available for all items that have been used to support meals that have been claimed for reimbursement. This includes, but is not limited to, grocery store receipts, milk purchases, bread purchases, vendor invoices, etc. The next one is inventory records. For schools specifically, RIDE recognizes that there is typically food left over from the school year and that you may have an excess of certain items, which will not necessarily be on the invoices, in which case inventory records would be required. The next one is pro production records. Although not a requirement, sponsors self-prepping or receiving meals from an FSMC should have some method of determining how much food to prepare, how much food was served, as well as the number of meals that were left over. Then we have menus marked with substitutions. Daily data menus with marked substitutions noted should be maintained for all meal periods. The sponsor should also maintain separate menus if different menus will be served, such as hot or cold meals. RIDE relies on the mentioned documentation when conducting a review, and any missing documentation could result in a fiscal impact of their sponsor. Linked on this slide are the methods of determining site eligibility that were mentioned previously in this PowerPoint. This concludes the SFSP annual training. Please find on this slide links to helpful SFSP policies and resources.